Good evening and welcome to another edition of Money Talk with Melanie. I am your host, Melanie Collette, and I am coming to you uh, live from beautiful, hey gang, from beautiful uh, Cape May County, New Jersey. Welcome. Happy, happy back from Thanksgiving Day. I hope everyone had a lovely, um, outstanding Thanksgiving and uh, found, found much to be uh, grateful <laughs> for. I see Mr. Deontay is in the house, as is Kevin Martin and uh, Ronald and Dan. Uh, Doug, hi, Debbie, hi. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm super excited. Um, I know I always say that, but I am. I'm so fortunate that I get, you know, such good guests that want to come on my show. I just, I, I'm always just, just really uh, excited. And uh, today's guest is Reese Arsty, and I'm sure I'm pronouncing his name wrong, and he'll, he'll correct me uh, on that when I talk to him um, shortly. Um, but he is uh, a financial aid expert and author, uh, which I thought that we all could use, those of us who are, are forever in school like myself, and <laughs> people say I'm either teaching school or or in school, which is true, or or both. I don't think I'm ever getting out, but uh, <laughs> but but um, he's going to um, I'm I'm, I'm going to hurt Deontay Johnson. For years, those of you who are listening on SHR Media, uh, as you know, I stream live on Facebook, and uh, some of the comments in the chat are distractingly hilarious. Uh, hi, Doug. hi, Doug. Somebody just asked me if my head was smaller. No, it is not smaller. It did not shrink. But anyway. <laughs> but anywho, um, I have uh, Mr. RSD uh, on as my guest today. And I'm very excited about that because he's going to tell us how to pay for college without going broken. It, there'll be some good information for, um, for parents as well as students. If... Um, your parents sent you to the school of hard knocks and said, pay for it yourself, as they should, by the way, because it's your education. That's just my opinion. You should pay for it. Um, then, then, then you'll, you'll, you'll want to listen up. And if you are parents, I apologize for that. If you are parents, I did not turn my phone off. I apologize. Uh, Rusty, it's been a week. Um, and if you're parents who are, you know, you guys are of the mindset in this day and age that, you know, our, our little uh, pumpkins can't pay for anything um, or, or suffer any type of, you know, sacrifice <laughs> until they're 30. So uh, th then you'll want to listen up for this as well, I would think, for, the, for this information. It's unbelievable, really. I mean, n not that my parents were like, get out, because they, they weren't. But, you know, I, I went to school at 17 and yeah, it was all about better get you a job or three. <laughs> if you, I, I, and I'm not, listen, I'm not mad about it. I, I think it, 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 it's a great thing, taught me uh, resiliency. The only way and probably that it did do damage is, is hard, to, hard to ask for help if you need it because you, you develop this sense of independence. I don't think the kids of today have that issue. <laughs> like the whole asking for help issue. Hey, Miss Misha, Mr. Misha, Greg, Gina, Matt, Robert. But anyway, uh, without further, further commentary on the whole, pay, uh, I'm being a hater, okay? Because I ought to pay for school. Lots and lots of money. <laughs> but uh, Mr. Arcee is going to help us um, with that situation. So I'm excited. Um, I'm very excited about that. I hope that was not him that just called the wrong number. We'll figure it out. Anywho, I'm so happy to see all you guys here. Um, but besides that, before we do that, um, a bit of housekeeping, um, I want to thank, first of all, I'll, I'll always thank one of my sponsors, Eva Rosenberg, AKA the tax mama. You'll hear her commercial in the next break. Um, but if you haven't been, the end of the year is coming. If you have not been to her website, uh, taxmama.com to ask a free tax question or to get any of her books, you should definitely check it out. She's got 20 years experience in the biz. And with tax um, reform on the horizon, I would think she's somebody uh, that you want to get to know. And she, she's, she's absolutely brilliant when it comes to all things taxes. So uh, she, she, she is your girl, the tax mama, taxmama 
com. Also, I have two articles out right now um, at thehornnews.com. They put us on double duty because we had a Thanksgiving break coming up. So um, I have two articles. Ah, that's my guest right now. I have two articles uh, at the Horn News. Good, good, good evening. I'll be right with you. I'm actually in the middle of my open. Thank you so much for doing the show, Mr. Yeah. RC. Thank you. And you'll tell me if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. <laughs> um, but what was I saying? Oh, I have two um, articles uh, on the Horn News website right now. One is entitled, um, it, it, and I'm not, listen, I, I love my editor, Steve Dietrich, but I just want you to know that like, I don't make up the titles that like you write the article that they ask you to write and any the editor, like they do their thing. So, so I just forewarn you. One of the titles is, um, how much is this Obama program still costing you? And then it, 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 that's about DACA and how much it costs. And plus, I, I just, I'm a nerd. I just love doing research, but it is uh, incredible amounts of money. And um, the second article is called, in simple terms, here's what tax reform means for you. So, and that's just a quick and dirty, nuts and bolts um, tax reform article. And you can find those both posted on my page, but if you want to go directly to the Horn News, you can find them there as well. If you want to um, follow me on Twitter or Facebook, Twitter is at Money Talk Mel or on my political page. If you want to see all the hate um, that comes with being a brown conservative, <laughs> uh, you can go to uh, uh, NJGOP Diva and follow me there. Uh, or you can like my Facebook page. You'll know who my wonderful guests are, such as uh, Reese RSD and, and other um, fantastic guests that, that I'm so fortunate to have on my show. You'll know ahead of time when they're going to be here. Daryl Graham's here. Hi, John. I just saw Claudia. Hey, you guys rock. Welcome. John, Gary, I'm sorry if I'm missing anybody, but welcome. So glad you, that you guys are here. So check those two articles out. And then finally, um, I, I was on um, Sirius XM last week. You can pick that up uh, on demand if you want. I got to interview Gordon Chang, which was on my bucket list. I still can't believe the people that I get to, to interview uh, when I do Sirius uh, Patriot Tonight. And uh, like, it's the same people that you see on national TV. And I'm like, well, how, do I, how am I getting to do this? But um, I got to interview Gordon Chang about Korea. So uh, my last visit there, and it was just amazing. She was like, who do you want for this? And I was like, do you think you can get Gordon Chang? And my producer totally made it happen. So it was great. So anywho, you can catch that on demand if you want. Uh, now, a little bit of Money Talk news. You guys probably have all participated in this, but Cyber Monday, which is today, is predicted to be the biggest online shopping day in history. They're predicted to do $6.6 .6 billion with a B. And sales. That's cray cray. And I haven't even spent any money yet. So it's probably gonna be up to another uh, another billion by the end of the day. I'm kidding. <laughs> but 6.6 .6 billion bucks. And, and listen, it, it speaks to the optimistic economy that we have going on. And if Congress doesn't get their collective behinds together and pass tax reform, we're gonna be in big trouble, which they're they're trying to do. Um, by Christmas, I believe. And they also have to, it, it, within the next week, uh, revise the federal budget and pass a budget measure. So we'll see if they, uh, you know, keep their act together and get that done. But they better get on it. Anywho, you're listening to Money Talk with Melanie. I am your business diva, Melanie Collette. Excited to be, I can't believe I have this much energy after a full day of working with high schoolers. It's probably the coffee. Uh, <laughs> but I'll be back in a few minutes right after this break. Well, growing up in Cleveland, my dad often instilled in me the benefits of maintaining a grateful heart. Hello, I'm Ron Edwards, shown today's page from the Edwards Notebook. Because of dad's teachings, including to be grateful every day I get up, it is not difficult for me to also be grateful for living in a rather fantastic republic. In fact, we all have that choice to either be grateful or to choose to be bitter and mean. As an American who happens to be brown skin, 
I can honestly say that there are many things to be grateful for, including my family. And that is why I find it reprehensible that former NBA player and current big mouth, LeVar Ball, chose not to be thankful that President Trump took the time to convince the dictator of China to release Ball's son and two others who allegedly stole designer sunglasses. They were facing over 10 years in a tough Chinese prison. But Ball chose to show a pedestrian attitude of ingratitude, probably because of the president being a Republican who is falsely accused of being a racist because he simply wants to protect America from terrorists and illegal immigrants. Mr. President, I for one am grateful for what you did for the three wayward Americans, but please stop giving Twitter attention to Mr. Ball and focus on making America great again. I, Ron Edwards. Sponsored by the Tri-County Liberty Coalition. Who likes paying taxes? Nobody. That's why Eva Rosenberg from TaxMama.com wants you to pay less of them. Read Small Business Taxes Made Easy and learn how legally hiring your spouse and children can slash your taxes. Learn how to set up a business plan that minimizes taxes, the benefits of setting up an exit plan, how to avoid getting audited, and how to legally increase your deductible expenses with better record-keeping techniques. Don't let the IRS squeeze you out of every penny. Visit TaxMama.com. Click on Ask a Tax Question to get free answers to your tax and business questions. TaxMama.com. That's TaxMama with one M dot com. Okay, we're back. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe we talked talk to Ron Edwards. Now, a lot of times, I'll, I'll tell you guys, um, a lot of times when I get his Edwards notebook, there's Ron. <laughs> hey, a lot of times when I get his Edwards notebook, sometimes when I play it, it's the first time that I've heard it. I can't believe he called Donald Trump out on his tweets. We're going to have to talk. Finally. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I just I just had to get that in, especially since he really can't respond. Without further ado, let me introduce you uh, to our guest today. Very excited about having him to talk about this topic. You want to talk about money talking and, and lots of money. First of all, uh, Reese, can you tell me how to pronounce your last name so that I, I don't do it incorrectly? Parish. Like Aristotle. Ah, okay, Aristy. Very good. Thank you so. And Reese, it's fine. Yes. Awesome. Uh, let me tell you a, a bit about my guest, Reese Aristy. Uh, very excited to have him on the show today. He is a respected college financial aid advisor and lecturer. He's been doing so since 1977. He's also the author of the book How to Pay. For college without going broke and he has helped thousands of families to protect their assets increase their wealth and reduce their taxes in the process you know he's been promoting this topic uh, that's of immense concern to families as I, as I discussed in the open you know how in the world do you pay for college uh, he's a founder and president of pay less for college in Boca Raton Florida and it's also a, a website which I'm sure he'll tell you about when we talk to him and uh, he's been presenting free seminars from coast to coast and has received rave reviews from parents students and guidance counselors and I'm very excited to have him on the show today thank you so much for your patience and me bloviating <laughs> Mr. Aristide I appreciate it very much how are you I'm fine thank you very much for having me on your show excellent excellent so uh, as I, I may not have told you, told you this in advance, but I'm a school teacher, I also teach college, and I'm, in, I'm still in college. I feel like I'm going to be in college forever. Uh, and so I thought tons of people would be interested um, in this topic of how in the world to pay for college. And you as, a, as an expert in the field and financial officer, I'm sure you have many, many good tips to share. So First of all, when we fill out the, and, and the process has changed, certainly, probably since you've been in the business, since the 1970s. Back, yeah, quite a bit. Sure. Right back in the day, when I first uh, went to undergrad, I had to fill out, you know, paper forms. You know, the FOSFA, but now everything is electronic. How can uh, families and students qualify for the maximum amount of financial aid that they're looking for? Well, it all depends. Uh there are a couple of scenarios. There's the ordinary family, two, two parents, and then there's the divorced or separated parents. And many of those folks have a 
situation where one of the parents is going to be the more affluent and the other parent will be the less affluent parent. And there are legal ways to have the lesser affluent parent be the custodial parent in the financial aid formulas. Really? It not, it, yes, it has nothing to do with the divorce decree. It all depends where the student is living. And they fill out the FAFSA. And if they're both, if both parents are in the same school district, it's not a problem for the student to live with the lesser affluent parent, as long as their driver's license has that address on it, and all the records at high school have that parent's address on it. If, for example, uh, the parents live in two different states, there's no problem with filling out the form with whomever the, the student lives with, and if it happens to be the more affluent parent, when the student graduates high school, there's nothing to prevent them from going to live with the other parent who happens to be possibly substantially less affluent. We then refile the financial aid forms, and the student can legally qualify for thousands or maybe even tens of thousands of hours of additional financial aid. Oh, wow. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Now, let me, let, let me back up just a tiny bit because I, I threw out that word FOSFA, and that's because I hear it all the time, and I've been dealing with the FOSFA form for, for years now. I'm my third year in my doctorate, so I, 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 me and FOSFA are, are good friends. Um, right. But can, can, we, can, we, can, we, can we tell the audience what exactly the FOSFA is, since I just I threw that out there? It's an acronym. Sure. It's the free, it's, it's the free application for federal student aid that every family must complete to get into the financial aid system. And it's a form. The FAFSA does not give any aid. The college does, and so does the government, and sometimes there are outside sources that uh, the student might get financial aid from. But it's simply information in, EFC out. The EFC is the expected family contribution, which is the minimum amount that the federal government determines that that family will pay for college wherever the student happens to go. And it's based on the PPY prior prior years income and tax information so students who are applying now which the the, the uh, financial aid uh, program began october 1st the financial information was based on the 2016 tax return which better have been filed timely right and that will determine of course It'll determine the uh, one of the determining factors for the expected family contribution, and the EFC is based on parent and student income, parent and student assets, age of the older parent, number of dependents attending at the undergraduate level, and a whole bunch of other factors. Exactly. Students in the financial aid system need to be broke. Because for every dollar they have, they lose 20 cents per year in financial aid. That's amazing. It really is. I mean, in a way, it's kind of messed up because it's like you penalize the kid that's a hustler. Like you penalize, right. you know what I mean? Like the government, and I, I get it in theory, but if you think about it, you would think you would want to encourage the kid that's a hustler, the kid that has some skin in the game. But that is absolutely not the way it works. Well, there, there are two portions. There's income and assets. Students have a $6,400 income protection allowance, but they have no asset protection allowance. So for every dollar they earn, they lose 20 cents. For every dollar they have, they lose 20 cents per year in financial aid. So uh, For those families who own a business, there's another strategy where they can legally, if it's a small business, owned and controlled by the parents, or one of the parents, they can legally put any of their children 14 years of age or older 
on the payroll and pay them $6,500 a year and the student will pay zero in income tax. Yes. If there, if there are two or three students and they, the business uh, has substantial income that might be paid out back to the parents, let's just assume that they have $18,000 of taxable income, the parents will probably pay several thousand dollars in income taxes. If they have three students, they'll pay zero. Exactly. So and, and then, of course, we have state taxes. We don't have those in Florida, but most of the other states have state taxes. Oh, we have plenty here in New Jersey. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, well, I grew up there, and I'm, I remember in when they instituted the sales tax in July of 1966 because I bought my car at Reedman Motors in Langhorne, Pennsylvania, and paid no sales tax. Exactly. That's perfect. That's perfect. And that, that strategy about employing yourself also also works uh, well tax-wise just in general. If you own a business, you want to make yourself an employee, ideally. Absolutely. Just, so, Absolutely. just like a little side note, money talk with Melanie, so, side note that that strategy works. That's a, that's a, a good tax strategy uh, for small business owners all the way around. Right. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've paid families thousands of dollars in income taxes in addition to increasing their financial aid. That's because amazing. Because once you get in the system and you get accepted to a college or hopefully several schools, um, the first thing they're going to do is send out an acceptance letter and then the student is in the acceptance mode. And most students ignore what they should do when they get a birthday gift from a relative and that's send out a thank you note because getting into college is a big deal and when they're in the acceptance mode they need to contact every financial aid officer who sent them the acceptance letter and along with the acceptance letter may or may not be an award letter for merit based aid yes a merit grant or a merit scholarship which has nothing to do with income it has to do with the students um, performance in high school their grades etc and once they get the merit aid they have to thank the person whoever it was that sent them the letter and the gift of possibly several thousand or maybe even tens of thousands of dollars of merit-based financial aid. And you can get that as a graduate student as well. I, I, I've received it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, there's, there are other things graduate students can do. But you can, you can yeah. just, I just want to put that out there for everybody who's listening. If you're an adult who's thinking about, um, you know, going to college and you, you if you got good grades in undergrad, you can get a merit-based um, like grant or a scholarship. I think I get like well, uh, two point two percent off a year or something like that, which is significant. Well, there are a couple of uh, other tricks that we have up our sleeve, and one of them uh, for graduate students or even undergrads, they find out which professors got fellowships and contacting the, the person who got this money, find you, it's tax-free, and if, if the student does research for them, they can get paid off the books. Oh, that's a good one. Oh, right. That's a real good one, because I'm thinking, like you said, a lot of people don't know, I, I've never heard of that. And I'm in the biz. All these, and all I've these never strategies heard of it. didn't come about overnight. I didn't dream them up. I've worked with these since 1979, and I have a very strong internet presence. I've had clients on three continents, and if I had been doing anything suspect one way or the other, I would have been locked up a long time ago. I was going to say, you'd be caught by now. <laughs> yes. Everything, everything we do is legal, moral, and ethical, period. Excellent. I love it. So what are some other little-known strategies that people can take advantage of? Well, you're in New Jersey, so if 
anybody who lives in the Northeast or the Midwest can't use this strategy, but folks in the South can. And when the award letter comes out and it doesn't meet all the need-based financial aid, and here's how the formula works. It's COA, cost of attendance, minus EFC, which is the expected family contribution. And if you take one thing from the other, you get FN, which is the financial need. And that's the maximum amount of need-based financial aid that a student can get. So let's take NYU, for example. The, the cost of attendance is 70000 or maybe it's a little more this year. I remember when it went up to fifty, and that was a long time ago. Woo! Now all, now all these high-profile schools, the cost of attendance is now in the seventy-plus thousand dollar range. So let's assume that uh, the student got an award letter from NYU. The cost of attendance is fifty, uh, seventy, and let's assume that their EFC was forty-five thousand dollars. So that leaves twenty-five thousand of need-based financial aid, and if they didn't meet the need 100%, then there's unmet need. And one of the uh, ways that we ask for more help, we don't ask for money, we ask for help. I write all these appeal letters. I've been appealing probably 98 to 99% of all financial aid award letters that uh, students get. I write the letter, the student signs it, and for those folks from the South who live in the South and they're going to school up North, one of the uh, things that I've been able to get for, for a select few students was a winter clothing allowance. And the most I ever got was $2,300. And that was for a student from Florida who went to Muhlenberg, which is outside of Philadelphia. What? Yes. <laughs> wow. That's you got the money for clothes because they're used to living in a warm place. So the theory, I, the working theory I'm assuming is they're used to living in a warm place. Therefore, if they're going to live up north now, they're going to need warm clothes that they normally would not have were it not for them going to school in a exactly. cold place. Exactly. Uh, one of my kids, I, I don't remember which it was. It was either uh, Rochester Institute of uh, Technology or Rensselaer Polytech. It was one of those two. And uh, we appealed the award, and the student got a $500, and they called it a grant, but it was a winter clothing allowance. So they don't have to pay it back either? Correct. Wow. Three months. Wow. That's here's, a a, here's a question for you, yes. and I'll answer it for you. Okay. How many, and for, the, for, the, oh, for your audience as well, how many opportunities for financial aid are there? Well, the student's going to be in undergrad for four years, you have to fill out the forms every year. The only difference is there are eight opportunities because there are eight semesters. <gasps> what? Wait a minute. How many students get aid for a college and don't show up in January for the second semester? So there's more money they available. They flunk out or whatever. So what you're saying so all that, is... All that money that was awarded to those students goes back to the college. Right. And a student did a really good job in the first semester right out of high school and, and didn't get all the need-based aid possible, then I simply write a letter asking for more help for the second semester because a lot of money that uh, was given out reverted back to the school, and we know 100% for certain that some of that money is not going to be available for the second semester, and we need a little help. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, that's good. That's really good. Because that's very, I mean, that's very true. I mean, yes, what? Of course. <laughs> and, the, and the, the, you know, in the second year, there's a lot more money available because a lot of students either lost their scholarship because they didn't maintain a 2.0 or, or 3.0 or whatever the uh, the GPA was to maintain a scholarship to, to continue it beyond the freshman year. And um, a lot of students will have transferred or flunked out 
or decided they uh, just want to drop out of college and go to work or go to technical school. So there could be tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars of additional aid available for those students that the school didn't meet the financial need 85, 95, or 100%. Now, how come this is not something that your admissions counselor, you know, emails you about or, or, or your, you know what I mean? Or your financial aid counselor doesn't email you like at the end of the semester and say, by the way, you might want to reapply so you can get more money. Well, they work for the people. Their, uh, best, their best interests are served for the college, not for the families of the students who go there. Who's yeah. writing their check? The school. True. It, they always seem like they're trying to help me, though. <laughs> well, they, they do to a degree, but their loyalties are to the college, not to you as a graduate student. Of course. Of course. That makes that makes a ton of sense. But I, I, I've i never heard of that because the FOSFA really gives you the impression that it's a once a year thing. And, I'm, and, and in the interest of full disclosure, I teach financial lit and we just had this question on a test. How often do you apply for the FOSFA as part of like a whole like, you know, preparation for life type deal? And well, you only uh, apply once a year for, for filling out the form. And then, right. of course, any mistakes or errors or changes, uh, you can correct it. But there are eight opportunities for financial aid because nothing will prevent a student from asking for more help for the second semester when they know very well that the college has more aid now because more money available because a lot of students who aren't going to show up for the second semester. That's fantastic. That's good stuff. That's really good stuff. So in, in addition to that, that's stunning, quite honestly. And you get a good response from that, from yes. the schools. You have to be persistent and you have to be nice. Nice is you important. Can't you can't demand and you don't ask for money. You ask for help. But if Way and, and the other thing, the appeals process can take from I've had the, the appeals process go from April to August, and in some cases, uh, I had another situation uh, a few years ago at Emory University in Atlanta, where it was a divorce couple, and the uh, the father was the nasty. Uh, ex-parent and we didn't finalize the we didn't, we didn't oh, hold on a second sure we, we didn't finalize the financial aid until november after the student had been there for a couple of months and that certainly happens that certainly happens oh, sure. it, can, it can be a nervous it can be a very nervous time um for the parents and the students when the financial aid situation is not um settled until after school starts, because you, you legitimately don't know how much money you're paying out of pocket. Correct. Correct. So, you know, that and can now, be... that, now that the Perkins loan has been canceled, where do you think that 5500 or 4000 or whatever amount of Perkins loan money the student might have gotten, where do you think that money is going to come from? It's going to come from a parent loan. And I, I... The, bulk, the bulk of the trillion dollar debt student aid debt is on the parents, not the students. Really? Students can't borrow. Students can only borrow $27,000 as an undergraduate in the Stafford Loan Program. I did not know that either. And I'm, sure, I, I'm going to guess many of my audience members had no idea about that either. Well, that wouldn't, that wouldn't surprise me either. That's a, a dirty trick that the Perkins loan was canceled because who's going to benefit? The federal government, because they're going to they're going to dole out more lo more parent loan money. When they changed the Stafford loan from twenty six hundred to thirty five hundred dollars several years ago, people thought, oh, that was a good deal. Well, it wasn't because it was a good deal for the colleges, because all of a sudden the difference. The, the college didn't have to come up with in a, in a grant or a scholarship because the student was now able to borrow more money. Well, whenever the government is handing out money, that, that, that is not, not usually a good thing. 
the entity that's benefiting from that is usually going to take advantage. And, and in right. this case, it's colleges and universities and the skyrocketing costs. We're, we're up against a break, but when we come back, I want to talk about um, how it's possible, if it is possible, to go to, you know, your, your dream um, private college for the same cost as a public college. I want to talk about that on the other side of the break, if you don't mind. Oh, that's fine, sure. You're listening to Money Talk with Melanie. I am your business diva, Melanie Collette. We'll be back in a few moments. My name is David Barnett, and I've been helping people buy and sell small and medium-sized businesses since 2008. So far this year, I've gone on five vacations. It's because I've got my own business. When you get tired of being managed by someone else and you decide that business ownership is right for you without the risk of starting your own unproven enterprise, then come over to businessbuyeradvantage.com. There are over 100 YouTube videos on buying and selling businesses that you can watch for free. That's businessbuyeradvantage.com. Who likes paying taxes? Nobody. That's why Eva Rosenberg from TaxMama.com wants you to pay less of them. Read Small Business Taxes Made Easy and learn how to set up a business plan that minimizes taxes. The tax benefits of different forms of financing, spot and fix errors in the 1099s. Legally increase your deductible expenses with better record-keeping techniques. Don't let the IRS squeeze you out of every penny. Start deducting today. Visit TaxMama.com. TaxMama.com. That's TaxMama with one M dot com. The best late night conservative talk show in America. Backhands Radio. And listen, there are no people better on the air to give you the best in conservative talk than Backhead John and Backhead Clint. Uh, and uh, we're working on celebration papers for certain other guys who have to support their Around the world to the best late night conservative talk, Tax Heads Radio. talk with Melanie. I am your business diva, Melanie Collette. Happy to be here with uh, Reese Aristi, who is um, talking to us today about college financial aid and how to pay for college without going broke. Has already uh, really ta taught us some, some very little known uh, tips and tricks in order to uh, pay for college without you know, give, giving away all your money, basically. And so if you are just joining us or joined us late, you definitely want to make sure that you listen to uh, the podcast that I post later on uh, where you can get some of that information. Before we broke, I, I asked about um, those, of, those people who want to, those students who want to attend a private college, but they think they can't 
afford it and how they might be able to afford it at the same price as a public college? Well, the private schools have more money than most of the state colleges, number one. State colleges have very rigid uh, guidelines when it comes to financial aid, and the private schools don't. And very often, the private college, which might cost twenty or $30,000 a year more than a state school, will be able to fund a student's education at 100% of the financial need, whereas the state college, in many cases, can't. You're so, I, I just, as soon as you said it, I was like, of course. That's why I'm a big advocate of school choice in the first place. For, for that very, because that also works, believe it or not, parents, if you're thinking about sending your kids to a private school, a K through 12, they offer financial assistance. And many times it's self-funded. A lot of people don't don't know that. But if you are if you have no money, but you have a kid who's a good student, look into a private school. If they're a good enough student and contestant, they'll they, they might offer them a full scholarship. Private schools absolutely offer full scholarships, K through twelve. Private schools. Yep, that's for sure. And, and part and, of the reason and the Ivy League like, all also gives merit aid. They say they don't, but I know they do because <laughs> I got a student uh, a few years back uh, at Princeton. Um, it's a long story, and I'll make it real short. But uh, for the first couple of years, they didn't fill out the parents didn't fill out the FAFSA because uh, the students had about seventy thousand dollars. He and his sister had about seventy thousand dollars in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, and they were afraid that they wouldn't qualify for any financial aid, so they ignored. Uh, filling up the form, and then they came to one of my seminars, and in the second semester of the junior year, I was able to get the student $18,030 of need-based financial aid. You're kidding. No, I'm not, and I have the documents to prove it. That that's amazing, but that but that is the, the inherent difference. And and you know, my audience knows that I, I've been on my soapbox about the whole education thing for a while now. But that's the major difference between pro public and private entities is that private entities' hands are not tied when it comes to uh, creatively financing what they want to finance, which is frankly why they do so much more with so much less. I mean, the private schools that I worked at. Cost much less per student to do a whole lot more than in private school, and there there's a reason for that. Well, so, Harvard has thirty six billion dollars in their endowment fund, and they could fund the entire enrollment for the next hundred years, and still have billions left over. Exactly, in private schools. You know, you might, you can have an, you literally can have an an eccentric alumni who's like, I, I you know, I want to finance a kid who likes the color purple, and now they'll find it, and and they can they can literally do that. So it's, it's, absolutely, they can do whatever they want. They can do whatever they want. They can do whatever they want. So and and listen, government is hand tied because it's public money, but some of it is total buffoonery too. It's just waste right. and, and buffoonery. No kidding. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So it's, uh, I, I just, I always encourage people to not be discouraged about the cost um, of private school. And if you look at their budgeting, you would see that by and large, private schools don't spend as much as public schools and they get a lot more done. Oh, absolutely. You know, and, that, and that's just because they, they, they can, they're accountable to their alumni. So they can't afford, they don't get to waste money. They just That's don't. Right. They just don't. They don't, they don't get to do that. So, you know, and, you know, not for nothing, they can be, their financial manager can be creative with how their money's invested. Oh, yeah. You know, where, whereas, you know, public entities can't do that. So, I mean, in fairness, that, that is part of the problem. So now, if you are a 10th or 11th grader, and you're interested in going to school, 
Is there any way to get interviews with the department chairman so that you can be ahead of the game? Is that possible? Yes. I get 10th graders, and every once in a while, in a rare instance, a ninth grade student, an on-campus interview as a non-applicant with a department chair. Because I work with kids from the I, – I like to work with students just before they get into high school, just when they're getting out of middle school, because once they get into high school, they're, they're laser focused. They know what it's going to take to get to where they want to be and to go to the colleges that, that hopefully uh, they'd be acceptable to. And it's very interesting because, I mean, I've had kids that uh, get really psyched up for high school when I, when I start working with them. And one of the first things that happens is that uh, the, the, the teacher will, or the teachers, will say, now, who wants to run for class president? And most of the kids will hide behind somebody who's tall. <laughs> My kids, they're out front with their hands raised because they know what it's going to take to get all these extra hours of community service, and uh, it, will, it will lead to dynamite letters of recommendation. I mean, I've, I've had students who had over 1,000 hours of community service, and when the transcript is read, in the admissions office, and they take a look at the uh, the GPA and the SAT or SAT2 or ACT scores, and then they say, wait a second, 1,112 hours of community service? What was their GPA, by the way? Right. They're overly impressed with what the student did for others rather than what they did for themselves. And it also speaks to discipline and and, and uh, perseverance and and things like that, that that I swear to you is more important than any SAT score. Sure. Well, there's an old saying, plan your work, work your plan. Nobody plans to fail, but too many people fail to plan. Exactly. Exactly. As much emphasis as schools put on the SAT scores, I, I, you know, I'm always shocked because I'm like, that's your SAT, being smart is hardly what you need to finish college. That's like, a no fraction kidding. of what you need to finish college. You need a whole lot of other stuff, being able to deal with people. Like I said, discipline, perseverance, you know, st stick-to-itiveness. Those are what you need, really, to finish school. Being smart's like a little bit of it. That's like, you, you're only like, you know, a quarter of the way there, just being smart, in my opinion. Right. I mean, it, matter of fact, I know a whole lot of people who aren't all that bright. <laughs> sure you have to be all that smart but um let me ask you this before we bring the show to a close uh how can uh, my audience avail themselves of your services directly and how where can they get your book where can they get in touch with you okay uh please go to my website www.paylessforcollege.com f-o-r college.com send me an email Mention Melanie's show, and I'll be more than happy to give any family a free consultation and a copy of my ebook, and we'll take it from there. Yeah. And, and to be very honest, it, after I talk to most families, there, there are usually uh, two choices. I can help them or I can help them. Excellent. I absolutely love it. I absolutely love it. You were chock full of just some fantastic information. So I can only imagine what it is that you can do for a family one-on-one. I mean, you're, you're talking about, uh, it's equal to, you know, a small home, what you could possibly pay for your education. Yes. And so with that kind of investment, I would think that you would want um, some type of consultant, somebody to go to, to, you know, to get good advice and save money in the long run, just like you would go to a financial advisor if you came into a large amount of money. When you're about to spend a whole lot of money, I would think you would want to go to a, a counselor who is knowledgeable about how to navigate that. Well, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. I just have to, to have been doing this longer than virtually anybody else in the business. Excellent. I absolutely love it. I appreciate you being on the show. I hope you will come back because Things are about to change dramatically, I suspect, since tax reform is uh, being passed. And, and I am sure 
that uh, Congress, that this particular Congress anyway, and that President Trump, I'm guessing, is going to be addressing the student loan situation and the debt situation, which is a whole other thing I'm sure we could discuss. Uh, yes, that's absolutely right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely. Have a great night. Oh man, I did not mean I did not mean to cut my guest off, but he was fantastic. Reese RC, he uh, is a college financial aid expert and author. And if you go to his website, which I um, posted in the chat on Facebook, and I will post in the podcast for you all on SHR Media and High Plains Pundit Talk Radio, who are listening uh, audibly, so that you can take advantage of his offer for a free ebook and a free consultation. Again. You were listening to Money Talk with Melanie. I am your happy business diva this evening, and I appreciate your listening and those of you and Facey in the chat for being here. Have a great night. And remember, all of this is very important because after all, it is your money.